all countries with whom Georgia signs the agreement to avoid double taxation. And Estonia is among these countries. So please feel free to earn income in Georgia, then you will be taxed in Georgia, because I think the income tax in Georgia is lower, and you will avoid the double taxation in Estonia. So this is the positive news from which we could start our second part of the lecture. OK, <coughs> so uh, excise tax. You know that excise tax is the tax which is going to the products which are produced in Georgia, imported in Georgia, or exported from uh, Georgia. And uh, mainly uh, this uh, tax is uh, fixed per physical unit of the product. It's a liter when we are talking about petrol or it's kilograms, or it's even units when we are talking about the cigarettes. So if you have such type of businesses, then there is an excise tax. There is no difference in Georgia on the excise tax side. The product is produced in Georgia or you are importing. So if the excise tax is, uh, for example, eight lari, uh, eight Tetri per cigarette, then it doesn't care cigarettes are produced in Georgia or they are imported. So you have the same excise tax. Then it the, differs from the type of cigarettes. That's good difference. So for the low quality cigarettes, the excise tax is lower, or the <coughs> high quality cigarettes, the excise tax is higher. And Okay, so uh, this is regarding the excise taxes, then the import taxes. Uh, honestly speaking, uh, we have one of the most liberal trade regimes because uh, approximately 90,000 products are absolutely fully free to be imported in Georgia. Just by the fact we are the members of WTO. So you know what this is, yeah? World Trade Organization. So we could not have any import taxes higher than the taxes which are fixed in the most favored nations regime. But uh, even we have the lower. Uh, mainly in Georgia we have two types of the import taxes. 5% and 12%. And mainly 12% is applicable to the agricultural products and food products. And this is, however, the one of the mechanisms somehow to protect domestic market from the suppliers outside of the country. And waste majority is 5%. But the huge majority is absolutely free. So you could import in Georgia without any taxes. Uh, we have some several free trade agreements, mainly it's are the CIS countries, and plus we have the partially free trade agreement with Turkey, and if in November we will sign the agreement with the European Union, so then we will have the DSFTA with the European Union also which also gives some stimulus and incentives for the investors and just to do business in Georgia or with Georgia. Property tax. <coughs> so, uh, if you remember, we talked that we have general taxes and local taxes. And the property tax is the local tax, which is administered by local authorities, each could not be higher than 1% of your property. But it could differ, it could be lower. Even the tax code of Georgia gives the local authorities uh, <coughs> the uh, responsibility to 
amend this tax just to make the region more attractive for investors. But honestly speaking, this is so low, 1% property tax per year, that it could not be uh, considered as a strong stimulus to move, for example, your uh, business from one region of Georgia to another. And this was always the somehow the field for the discussions, for different ideas, uh, and as I already told you, this is uh, just to give some financial stability for the local authorities. And it doesn't play just a serious, just to say, role in this uh, economy. Uh, and um, there was some ideas just to abolish this property tax. When we discussed it with the business people, they said that it could not be considered as somehow very positive. And so now we have this property tax, and it not, could not be higher than 1% all over the Georgia. And now we are coming to the very important topic, which is the protection of taxpayer rights. Because, just corresponding with my colleague who was before here, the Soviet Constitution, by the way, which was written on the paper, was one of the most democratic constitutions in the world. And if you will imagine that the first constitution was written in 1936, Stalin Constitution, which was guaranteeing absolutely all basic human rights. But this was on the paper, and that happened 1937, 1938, and so on. So there is one thing what you have on the paper, and there is another thing how this is executed. And what are the mechanisms and instruments to protect your rights? Because if tax code said that you should pay 12%, it always depends how the tax inspector will calculate from which sum you should pay 12%. He could not say you should pay 14, but he could say you are paying not from 1 million gel, but you are paying from 1.5 million gel, and the same percent, but from the much higher figure. So how this uh, <coughs> rights should be protected. And uh, in this field, Georgia just uh, takes uh, some <coughs> European experience. First of all, there was a special chapter included into the tax code. And this chapter is dedicated for the protection of taxpayers' rights. This is the one major thing. And this introduces principles to ensure the protection of taxpayers' rights, which includes the right to request information, which means that the taxpayers have the right to request the information. So, tax collector, tax inspector could not come and say, oh, yesterday we changed <laughs> some principles, so now the sum from which we are calculating your taxes increased. No. So you have the right to request this information. Confidentiality. For sure, because you are in business and your information should be confidential because it's uh, to put you in the same situation in protection and your rules. The right to enjoy tax benefit and claim overpaid tax. So, uh, when government are putting some new incentives, for example, government is saying that in some harsh regions we want to have special tax incentives, and you are operating business there, then you could have this tax benefits and claim for the overpaid taxes. Also, protection of taxpayers' legal interests. This is a uh, quite important topic, but uh, how you are protected your legal interest, the major thing is who is your lawyer. And usually the best
best lawyers, you should pay very high. And this is the topic. And also is a special new post put it into the government. This is a tax ombudsman. So the person who is put in the cabinet of the ministers and who is looking to protect taxpayers' rights. This is like the ombudsman which are in every country, but he is dedicated for the taxation system. So any legal entities, <coughs> any business could apply, bring their own case to the ombudsman mm -hmm. and say that, for example, there is a huge difference <coughs> between my understanding how to calculate this tax and the understanding of the tax inspector and please review. But uh, honestly speaking, uh, the major thing is that you should have a special arbitrage because for the business is very important how quickly the solution will be found out. And when we are looking at the situation, just to say broader, what we are talking about, this is the business government relations. But there is nothing about the business to business relations. Imagine that you have some contracts with the other businesses and your counterpart break out the contract. And what's happening after? If this case at the court will take years, you lose the benefits, you lose the profit. So what you need is to quickly solve the problems, and you not need that the, somebody will say you are right. You also need the execution, that your funds will come back to you, that you will be secure. This is the problem. Until now, this is the problem in Georgia. This is a huge, just to say, discussions how to put arbitrage in place. Uh, in 2004, Georgian government initiated and uh, created this arbitrage. But first five cases, they lose. And the reason was simple. Uh, business guys, they have the better lawyers. The, you know, the government is always in the position, these are our funds, okay, for these funds we could hire this guy. Which is not bad, but he is not the best. Business guys go to the best. And then in arbitrage, you could imagine, the yeah, best guys always are better than not so brilliant ones. And then they abolished this, said that we are not ready. It was quite interesting. We are not ready, it seems who? Who is we? We is the Georgian government, is, or we is the society. Because from the business side, we find out that they are ready. But till now, uh, after nine years, this is a still going, ongoing discussion. And till now, there is a discussion that maybe we could introduce or how we could introduce uh, and this is always one of the major points uh, which I'm talking about uh, that this is a real obstacle and it's quite uh, difficult to explain not only for foreign investors but even for the Georgian businesses why this problem could not be solved but for the, for the moment, we have the situation which we have, and nothing to do with this. Uh, please, here are the information sources to obtain uh, most updated information regarding the taxation system in Georgia, what would be the news in this system, and how you could contact the tax inspectors or Ministry of Finance, how you could realize 
your right to have access to the information because it needs some specific steps to be undertaken. Uh, so, for this moment, uh, we just go through the legalization and taxation uh, systems. And I need, or I could say that uh, we could just make the major highlights, what we speak about, so the major, just to say, topics. The first is the legalization. So what means the legalization of the document in Georgia and how it is written in Georgian legislation? It's nothing just to say difficult, but very important. So you need to know what is the process of legalization, how it could be done, where it is written, what are the steps and procedures. Also, as it as apostille, apostille uh, means that if you are coming with a certificate from Estonia, for example, apostille means that it should be confirmed the authenticity of this document. In some uh, positions, maybe for example, you need uh, the certificate of your higher education, and you will bring your documents that you have the MBA, for example. And the apostille means that somebody should certify the authenticity of this document. And here are the basis on which Georgian uh, legislation is issuing and asking for the apostille of the uh, document. Uh, so activities to obtain licenses and uh, permits. So, uh, construction, communication, and plus we have the uh, activities which are licensed to use resources. For example, as I uh, already told you, if you want to bottle the mineral water or sparkling water and you are using the resources, then you need to have the special permission to this. Uh, regarding how long it takes to register, I think we'll discuss it in details. So it could be one business day or it could be the same day. It differs how much you are paying, 100 lari or 200 lari. Uh, uh, preconditions of legal stay in Georgia. Uh, honestly speaking, there are not, just to say, the special working visas or you don't need any other uh, documents to stay in Georgia. Mainly, if you are coming as a visitor uh, to Georgia, your visa could be obtained at the airport. And it's, uh, it's valid up to 90 days. If then you need to stay as a resident, then you should apply to the respective authorities to legalize your stay in the country. Another thing, uh, incorporated or okay, uh, can a foreign national be a managing director, officer of a company? We talk about this. Yes, there is no legal, as to say, things which are saying that the foreign national could not be the director, managing director, or take the position of the officer of the company. Uh, minimum charter capital requirements. If you are going to have LLC, there is no requirements, any. So, there is no any requirements for the uh, minimum capital. You could do it quite easy. Uh, okay, that's, that's the things which we already talked about. Now, I want uh, to go as we talk about some other, uh, just to say, rankings, to have the better understanding of the country. And first, look at the Economic Freedom Index, which is updated every year. And this is done uh, by the World Heritage Foundation. 
and Wall Street Journal. And it's based on four major, just to say, indicator, group of indicators, rule of law, limited government, regulatory efficiency, and open markets. And then you have under these topics, you have also many other uh, more specific topics. Just look uh, for 2013. Estonia is on the 13th position, it's here. And Georgia is on the 21st position, which is fall in the group of mostly free economies. The higher group is only five countries which have the status of the free economies. Hong Kong, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, Switzerland. Hong Kong, Singapore, Australia, and New Zealand, this is the classic Anglo-Saxon model of doing business with the minimum uh, requirements, with very liberal approach. Switzerland, this is a different story, <coughs> totally different, which is going back to the centuries, to the, the tradition, and which Switzerland is a country uh, which has a, a absolutely different, uh, just to say, historical background. The major European powers agree that they need one country which will be absolutely free of any wars, there will be minimal criminal and so on, and, and these powers will be Germany, France, Italy, and also Great Britain, and they agree that there is a place in Europe which could be free of any of such type of things. And this is the history of the Switzerland. Its economy, how it's grown, despite the fact that it's one of the most militarized countries in the world, they have the natural status. But other four is understandable. So uh, if we will compare, for example, Estonia to Georgia, and look at the figures. Uh, red is Estonia, and this is the ranks of Estonia over the years. And the green is Georgia. And look that in 1996, there was a big difference between uh, economic freedom in Estonia and economic freedom in Georgia. But by the Step by step, this difference was decreasing. Now we are very close, despite the fact that you are on the higher positions than we, but we are in the same group, which means the mostly free economies. I could not imagine that both of our countries would be in the group of the absolutely free economies, because you are European Union member, and nobody will allow you to be so free. If you will look, the Switzerland is also a European country, but not the member of the European Union. And we are going also to be the members of the European Union, maybe in 10, 15 years, I don't know. I don't think that it will be ever. So, European Union member countries could not be in the fully free economies. This is absolutely clear. But mostly free, it's also quite good. Uh, and even you could see that where you have the, more or less, if you were compared, limited government. Member of the European Union could not be limited government. The government spendings are quite high. Tax burden is high. So then it's not the position you could achieve the better uh, positions. Uh, also, we could look uh, for other South Caucasus countries, uh, our neighbors, for example, Armenia is on the 38th position, which is moderately free, which is quite close to the mostly free economies. Uh, and it totally differs from the position of Azerbaijan, 
88, which is mostly unfree economy. And uh, Azerbaijan is very rich by the oil and gas resources, and government is putting into as to say, circulation is a policy that everybody should be licensed and everybody needs some special permit to do some business in Azerbaijan. But as the prices for oil are high, state budget, Azerbaijan state budget doesn't have any problem. So nobody is saying that why we are not so free. If they will they would have some problems with the refinances, and maybe <coughs> there would be some steps to liberalize the economy. I'm not uh, sure that they would start this in the nearest five to ten years. It's uh, absolutely different mentality. And uh, when you are rich by oil and gas, you do not need to think about other uh, business activities. What you need is to think how to distribute this earnings which is coming from the state budget. And it's the only problem which you have at that moment. Another interesting also, in my understanding, would be corruption perception index, which is also uh, quite interesting if you are thinking to start some business activities. Uh, business look at the corruption in, just to say, in a little bit different approach. Uh, on one hand, it's always additional, just to say, costs. But on another hand, uh, you could solve your problems quite quickly. And one of the most corrupted countries in the world is the Nigeria. But despite this fact, BP is working there. And they are not saying that they have some problems. Because corruption also gives you some benefits. You could very quickly solve the problem if you will pay a certain amount of money. And for business, cost is cost. If I am paying for the bribe, this is cost. If I am paying as taxpayers, this is also the cost. So what is the difference? In some cases, bribes are even cheaper. But the problem is that all such type of countries are not stable. So you pay one guy, and after one week, he changed. And another guy doesn't take into consideration the fact that you pay that general. They want you to pay once more. So this is the problem also with corruption. If we look at the if we look at the corruption perception index, we will find out so who are in the top: Denmark, Finland, and New Zealand. Yeah. Denmark and Finland, it's okay. North. Europe, it's understandable, uh, and New Zealand, it's also, in my opinion, it's also understandable. So where are our Estonian friends? They are on a quite good 32nd position. That means that you are one of the less corrupted countries in the world, which is quite good. Where are Georgia? We are on the 50 first position, which means that also we are not suffering from corruption. It's different. <coughs> the one thing is you are suffering from corruption, another thing you are absolutely free from corruption. And just compare, for example, these figures with our neighbors to find out how things are going in South Caucasus. Armenia is the position 105.
and Russia and Azerbaijan. It's a position 133 and 139. So it's several countries have the same index. So they are on the position of 133, six countries, and then position of 139 is Azerbaijan. That means that these countries suffer from corruption. That the corruption is part of the day life. That you could not do business without bribes. This is incorporated on, of, on your business model. Without bribes, there would not be any business. It's not possible to do business if you are not paying bribes. And this is the reality, which is shown by this corruption perception index. So, if we just summarize uh, this, Things we could say is that positions of Georgia are more or less quite good because it's a mostly free economy one and country is not suffering from corruption. Uh, you could believe me and then you could ask the Georgian students because they know that 10 years ago the country really suffered from corruption because it was at the every stage was uh, in police, it was in uh, any of the legal entities, but then have been undertaken the quite radical steps, and now the new generation, they don't know even what means to pay for police guy, <coughs> or what means to go to the real, uh, registry agency and say that here is a 50 lari, please take it and give me the documents because you could take it even without this 50 lari. Yeah. So now the situation is much better, but we are far from the situation which are in the Nordic countries and this is the direction in which we want to move. And there was a huge discussion, um, I could remember even in academic circles, uh, and the, many of my colleagues said uh, the corruption is a problem which could not be solved. Uh, in practice, uh, we could say that it could be solved. Maybe uh, in Georgia the steps have been very radical. Uh, maybe government uh, was too tough. But then we have the result. So if uh, we will go in the same direction, not be so radical, not be so tough, and we could gradually increase and make the situation even better, which we have just for the moment. So this was too, just to say, quite interesting indicators uh, to look when you are thinking about the country, just are you going to have business with it or not. And there is also another, also quite uh, interesting indicator, which is the Global Competitiveness Index. I hope you know about this. If not, please feel free. I could tell you a few words about this. So, do we know it or not? Right side knows, left side, okay. So, uh, Global Competitiveness Index is produced by the World Economic Forum. And it's produced every year. And it's the idea which is standing behind is to show the competitiveness of the nation. So how they competitive are, how they could, uh, just to say, produce uh, goods and services at the very competitive levels. And the, there are three major pillars, the basic requirements, efficiency enhancers, and innovation and sophistication factors. And then 
you have the overall index. Uh, mathematically, it's not uh, so difficult to calculate because all of the indexes have their own weights. In reality, if you will take one, for example, basic requirements, it has its own weight, and every indicator inside the group, they also have their own weights. So this is uh, evaluated on this basis. So, what could we say about this uh, indices? And, uh, sorry? Where is Estonia? I think you had guys quite a good position. So, here is Estonia. 30 seconds in the world, which is really quite good position. Which means that you are not in leaders, but you are very close to leaders. And taking into consideration that this country is not rich in natural resources, this is the excellent result. What about Georgia? Uh, we have the 72nd position. Here we are. I could say that uh, from the 2005, when first report was produced on Georgia, mm -hmm. this is the best position even we have. <laughs> so we started from the position of approximately 83, and then gradually, very slowly, but we improved our uh, competitiveness index in the world and now we are on the position of uh, 72. So all countries are grouped into five major groups. So we are now in the third group which is called efficiency driving economies. <coughs> Estonia is in the second group which is transition from efficiency driving to innovation driving uh, economies. So you could see that, for example, uh, Azerbaijan has a better position than Georgia in competitiveness. It's higher <coughs> here, 39. Yeah. Plus, is Canada is, uh, is more competitive, although it's uh, more corrupt than the plus three. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, competitiveness index is um, based on many different, just to say, uh, indicators. And one of the major indicators is GDP per capita. And due to the very high oil prices, Azerbaijan has quite high GDP per capita. Plus, when a country is rich in oil and gas, there are many other companies all over the world which are interested to invest in this country. So your competitiveness is high. You know? It's quite difficult for countries without resources to achieve the higher positions. With countries which have such type of resources like oil, gas, diamonds, gold, uranium, oxides, aluminium, it's quite easy. I mean, comparatively, it's not so easy, even, but it's quite easy. Yeah. And as I told you, we are one of the most corrupted countries, but when you are rich, nobody looks at this corruption because everybody needs oil, so they are coming and working. One of the most corruptive countries is Russia. But BP is still just working in Russia and wanted to increase their operations in Russia. Even they had the scandal with the Tianga BP, where the Russians cancelled their contract and said that we don't know you to work with us. But when you are rich with this, such type of resources, you are really quite competitive. So this is the logic behind. And, but this is uh, giving you also the understanding because, for example, if, if you look 
at Georgia, this is quite interesting. The overall, our index is 72. In basic requirements, it's 57. It's so very good. But then we have the 86th position and 122nd position in innovation. This is a major problem. And if you have it in basic requirements, means the network infrastructure and government could deeply uh, invest in roads, in railway stations, in even market infrastructure. But what could do government to increase innovation? There is the only way you should put more and more money in the education. But then you will have the shortage of money to make better your infrastructure. And then you should make the decision. Georgian government made the decision that first they should invest in infrastructure. And our position in this really now are better. But then less money go for education. And with the less money in education, you have problems with the innovation. Now look at Estonia, how things are going with Estonia. <coughs> because the indicators are the same, yeah, you know. So, 31st position. Uh, and Estonia. So, uh, 32 and 34, very close. So, all, <coughs> all indicators, all indicators are very close. 29, 35, 28. This is uh, also one of the uh, things which is indicating that the country is quite well developed. Because you could not have the huge difference between the basic requirements and innovations. And when you have the difference, for sure you will have difference in the positions. But when you are in the same group, then it means that you are developing quite well. You are going quite well. I have so, a question. Yes, please. Previously, you talked that, uh, about the taxes, and all those taxes are really trade oriented. Uh, let's just say that Georgia will develop in a certain level in the future. Wouldn't be those taxes an obstacle to move your economy more to innovation? And uh, why you mean that this tax is. Because all, all of those business guys are what? just wanting to make trade, not to manufacture some sophisticated thing. Because of the taxes? Yeah. I don't think so. I don't think so that uh, the taxation system of Georgia is uh, putting a Georgian uh, entrepreneurs in the position that it's better to trade than to manufacture. Honestly speaking, major problem which we have is that we don't have professional trading companies. We are much better in manufacturing than in trade. And this is a really serious problem. If you will look, just take the example of France and sector Y. How the sector is organized? Farmers, wine producers, wine traders. They are working as a chain, but everybody knows what are their exactly responsibility. How this is organized in Georgia? Company, farming, bottling, selling. And it could not be effective. When you are selling by yourself, you could not be so effective. One company would be effective in producing, another would be effective in trading. This is the rule. If you will take, for example, the Germany, one of the best manufacturers in the world, yeah, and look at their export, 52% or more is exported by trading companies, not by the producers by themselves. 
And this is the problem. Any problem, always, is also opportunity. Yeah? So, if it's a problem, solution would be the opportunity. And thus we could think about how to create quite innovative thinking trading companies. Why you put innovation and trade into different uh, places? I don't think it's the right approach. So many innovations are in the trading sector. Just look how many innovations are coming from retailers. And this has a logical explanation. They are closest to the consumer. So, uh, I don't think that it's a problem. If you are talking about to make in manufacturing companies taxes even lower, I couldn't say that this would be the solution or it could be effective. On the contrary, I was lobbying the idea that trading companies should pay lower taxes. And then there would be real incentives for them to start trading activities. And then this will serve for manufacturers to increase their level of the manufacturing products. This is the explanation. Maybe you could agree with me or not, but this is the way in which I see the solution of these problems. And based on my uh, expert promotion uh, uh, experience, practical experience, I could say that this is works all over the world. Strong trading companies are the leaders to move ahead. Okay? Is there any other questions regarding? Yes. Can I, can I just show the stats for the John again? How it refers to different sectors, different indicators? For Estonia and Georgia? So Estonia is like everything, all indicators are more or less equal. Despite the Georgia is not, and showing us in the other version, what's their, where they're really good at. Okay. Okay, we could go to the other slide. So you want to... I mean, I meant to a competitiveness index. Ah. I like mean, these three different categories. Ah, in competitiveness index, or we could, uh, we could look here. Okay, for Estonia. No, no, Estonia is like everything's quite equal, and I want to just have a look at Azerbaijan. Where Azerbaijan, here is. Okay. 39. Set, uh, just come down. Azerbaijan, okay. 39, basic infrastructure 44, then 66 and 60. This is the positions in three major pillars, which are the basic requirements, efficiency enhancers, innovation and sophistication factors. So they're all, uh, so they are all like closer together than Georgia, the narrower range. In Georgia, no. Yeah, in Georgia they're like more spread. Yes. So we say then that the Azerbaijan is more developed than Georgia because it's like the narrower the range is the more developed the country. Uh, in some, in some way, yes. Okay. In some way, yes, because uh, you know, always this is the problem of the your priorities, how you will set up the priorities. We are not the rich country, and when the government said that huge amount will go into the infrastructure, this was more or less clear, that you will improve your position in infrastructure, but your position in innovations will be at least at the same level. But this was the logical, the, okay, this was the decision, behind this you could find out the logic. Another thing is, you agree or not, but then uh, we have this situation for the moment. Now, um, most funds should go to the education to improve the situation with education, to improve the innovations. 
and maybe looks logical to bring uh, foreign companies who could bring the innovation. And here Estonia has some real opportunities, which could be serve as a basis to build up the profitable business. Okay, could we leave this or is it so interesting that we have... Please feel free. And you could easily obtain this information by yourself. Yeah, it's not difficult. World Economic Forum and then it will show you the competitiveness indexes for 2000. And then you could also look at changes during the period, how the things were going and what are the mm -hmm. achievements and so on and so on. Okay, so just leave this situation. Uh, we look at the competitiveness index, we look at the economic freedom index, we look at the corruption perception index, I hope you more or less have now just in a very broad and general understanding of Georgia, or not, more or less, yeah, good. So, uh, but we need also uh, to discuss other topics regarding the Georgian economy and always for any of the investor or any of the entrepreneur who is interested in the country, one major topic is labor relations. And just may uh, give some few minutes to explain you uh, the story which was behind. In 2007, uh, Georgia has one problem in the uh, competitiveness index, which was the problem that labor force was inadequately educated. What it means? It means that they are quite good educated generally, but they don't have specific practical skills. You understand? This was one problem. Another problem was quite low, just to say, working culture, which means that persons are quite freely coming to the, their organizations, going earlier, and so on. So we really have these problems. And then there was a question, how could we improve the situation? You could not change your people just by decree. You could not say that you should be better educated or you should behave better yourself as the world. And uh, then there was the idea just to give the better opportunities for the business just to easy hire and then so easy fire the persons. I, yeah. I could understand that this was not maybe the best approach, but for the moment, it was the only solution. Most effective, yeah, you are right. Because if I am saying that my workforce is not so good, how I could compensate to you? And another problem was, that in 2003, there was undertaken a huge a special research on the labor costs. You are familiar with the uh, unit labor cost idea? So you know what is it, unit labor cost? No, okay. What means unit labor cost? So we have a guy whom we are paying five dollars per hour, who is producing 15 units of something. Doesn't matter. And we have B guy, whom we are paying 
seven dollars per hour. Who is cheaper? It depends on what. Uh, it depends on how much he yeah. is producing, and this is the unit labor cost, or we call it rule. In this case, this guy is cheaper. We are paying higher, yeah. but That's if we will recalculate per unit, we will have less amount of funds. And due to this research, there was finding out that unit labor costs in Georgia are quite high. Now, you are in the position of the government. On one hand, you want to increase foreign direct investments. On the other hand, it's not hidden, this information. It's open to any of the investors, which is saying that you have problems with the labor force and that your labor force is not effective. Your solution. I understand, yeah, it's always very difficult. But you don't have time. You could say, I will heavily invest in education, but it will bring the results after five, six years. And the most effective way was to make labor relations very free, to give to the business opportunity to very easy hire persons and also easily fire them. This was the idea which was heavily criticized in Georgia, both in parliament, in political parties, in academic, just to say, groups, in think tanks, uh, and, but uh, on another hand, this was the only solution. And in 2007, we have one of the best results in foreign direct investment. In 2008, for eight months, we have the better, but then something happened in Georgia and all over the world also. So, this practical solution uh, on practice gave us uh, the opportunity to really attract investors to come to Georgia. But then the situation changed because, uh, you know, it's not only because the politi political, just to say, uh, power goes to the opposition, because it's now it's not the same. It's 2013. And now this uh, situation when you could easily fire, easily hire persons, should be changed. And in the latest uh, decisions of the Parliament of Georgia, they change uh, make, introduce some changes into the labor uh, code and make it more close to the European, just to say, uh, principles. So it's not so easy to uh, fire persons. But just sample from my practical experience, uh, as I told you, by the end of the last year, I was working as a business consultant in different private companies. So what they do, before the changes pass the parliament, they ask all their staff to sign special agreement, which was saying that now their relations would be under the old code. And they are not going to sign new contracts which would be in line with the new labor code. This was the reaction of the business. We could say it was bad. Legally, legally, when we discuss this problem with uh, different uh, guys, they told us, yes, you could do this. But only the newcomers could be under the new code. But then you have another option. 
you are signing contract for one month. Then, after one month, you are signing another contract for one month. This is also uh, which approach which business uh, could do. But the uh, problem is still there. Problem is that the labor force is not so well trained and educated. We have absolutely just to say good uh, figures in, for example, literacy. 99.9 percent .9 is the literacy level in Georgia. We don't have problems on the level of the, just to say, school and high school education. So everything is. Fine. But the problem was on the level of the professional education. <coughs> and here we really suffer from the uh, problems. And uh, when we are talking about the freedom index was 1999, we are talking the index which was before uh, parliamentary elections of 2012. And it was the old. Uh, labor code of Georgia. Now, situation changed, not dramatically, not think that now if you will uh, hire the person, the person will stay with you till the end of the life. No, it's not such changes. But now, staff working, uh, staff is more protected. And is given more clear uh, incentives, for example, how many days they could have the holidays, from which, which are the paid holidays, which are not paid holidays. Because in majority of the uh, business companies, they don't use this uh, more than 10 days paid holiday. And it was usual. I don't know how it works in Estonia. How many day, days you have paid holidays? 28. 20? 28. 28, okay. Now in our labor code it is written 24. In former Soviet period, uh, as you have been, for example, the professor of university, you have 45 days. 45. So, it's different. So, uh, also there was a huge disbalance between the notification. For example, if you want to move from your position to another company, you have been allowed only to give the one month earlier notification. So if I want to move on the 14th of October, I should apply to my boss on the 14th of September. And it depends on him or her, they could say, OK, you could go. Or they could say, no, one month you will stay with us before we will fulfill all procedures to find out another guy. On other side, the person could be fired in one day. One day prior notification was uh, normal. So on the 14th, they are saying 15th is your last day in the company. And this is also the idea how to decrease the cost, you know? You are not paying. So there is only one day. It's understandable that on 15th nobody will work in normal, just to say, uh, conditions. But this was the huge disbalances which we have in our uh, uh, labor code and which have been improved now, really. Also, there was uh, some, just to say, some, uh, indications from the European Union. Uh, it, it was not like directives, it, but it was the indication that maybe, guys, you should make your label code a little bit more European, not so just to say wild as it was, because you are, want to have the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement. But uh, still now, uh, till now, the problem is uh, with the workforce is still exist. 
and there are the set of the problems. For example, uh, the, our old generation, which is uh, higher than 15 years old, they speak Russian, but they don't speak English. Young generation speak English, they don't speak Russian. Uh, this old generation, they always talk about the fine Soviet period when everybody was working, when your social guarantees have been in place, you have the paid holidays, and so on. And it has this nostalgia uh, regarding this Soviet period. Young generation does not have this nostalgia, but they like to jump one workplace, because they are very mobile, you know, and from one place to another. And honestly speaking, if you are looking for the quite professional guy, you will have the problem. Because uh, as long as I have participated in different, uh, just to say, process of the identification of the persons, it was really the problem. Because uh, quite a huge portion of the persons are coming without any skills, any understanding uh, what is their job is to do. Only just saying, I want to work and I will do my best. But it's quite difficult to understand what would be your best. Maybe your best is not enough for us. So this was a really, really problem. Uh, what was the solution? Government. Uh, from now 2007, 2008, and 2009, heavily invest in the professional education and build up the different professional uh, schools where you could obtain this information. Uh, business uh, is still waiting for the government and saying that all these costs should be on your side. We are only just to say beneficiaries of the workforce. We don't want to invest into the education. We are not going to uh, take some responsibility in this field. But we are ready to receive good professionals, which is you know, unfair position, but uh, nothing, nothing to do. So, uh, if you are going uh, to launch the business in Georgia, you will find out a lot of persons with MBA degrees, with whom 10 to 15 percent will be really good. You will not have problems with the guys uh, in finances accounting, marketing, less human resource management, but still you will find out. But if you are looking for the salesperson, if you are looking for some manufacturing activities, then you will have problems. Then you will really have the problems. In these fields, for example, you are looking for a professional accountant, you could, you could have a good choice. Usually, uh, in Georgia, professional accountant, accountants are working in two, three, even more places. They are not signing a contract to work only with you. Even they are signing contract for four hours per week, five hours per week. It depends on your size of your company. It depends on in which field you are operating. So it's quite easy. But for example, professional salesperson and persons who could sell professionally in the service sector, in the manufacturing sector, this would be a problem. You should be aware of this. I don't know how this in Estonia, I hope that uh, due to the new positions in the competitiveness index and other indexes, more or less with the workforce, your problems are solved. Because in other cases, you could not do it. Then, if we will go, uh, 
So, till now, this labor code is quite flexible. Till now. Even with this amendment, it's uh, quite flexible and uh, it gives employer employees the freedom to stipulate the terms and conditions of the labor through a contract. And, uh, in Georgia, honestly speaking, we don't have, just to say, typical labor contract which means that all terms should be same. It's not, uh, we are not using this typical contract. It depends on the uh, film activity. Huge, just one sentence, and a huge discussion was uh, regarding the overtime works. Because um, in majority our companies are saying that we are paying for overtime but we are paying in a different way. So why do we need to put it into the contract, please? So you have a probation period in Georgia? Yes. How long it is? Yes. How long it is? Usually, uh, uh, it's not put in the labor code that you should have probation period for. Uh, usually, usually, companies are using one month, mm -hmm. usually. And, uh, but in some cases you could use three months period. For example, when I was starting as a business consultant, I had the four months probation period. But this was with the first company. With the all other companies, I had the contracts without any probation period. So, but I could understand this is a very narrow field. You know, it's a very narrow and then the information regarding this was freely circulating from one guy to another. Yeah. So, over time, this was a uh, problem, and it's always a problem, for example, in a retail sector. Uh, how you are paying the overtime? Is it fixed in contract? Or if persons are paid on the bonus basis, then this includes the overtime work. It was a huge discussion that there should be clear indication what should be overtime and could uh, the person say no. In former period, uh, usually uh, the persons uh, were, were not allowed to say no, I don't want even if you are paying me double rate, I don't want to work. Now, in the labor code is put in the sentence that person could say no. And after this, they could not work over time. But you know, if uh, you have the double rate you know, that over time, then it's quite easy. Another thing is also, you know, what is written on the paper, it's written on the paper. If you say no, then you'll probably get fired. Maybe. Another thing is, I will uh, sign contract with you, but I am not put five days per week, eight hours per day. So I will put less hours. And then use this and say that your maximum should be not more than 40 hours per week, and as you work only 32, now you could work this eight hours. So it depends. And uh, when you have the situation on the market where there is a quite high unemployment rate, then the boat is always on the side of the business and who is looking for the workforce. It's, it's not so easy to protect. And even uh, you, you want to say no, but you bear in mind that, okay, I will say no, and what happened after? And nobody could put the sentence in the law saying that you could easily say no and nothing will happen. It's not the same. It not works in this way. Yeah? Because then are the problems with the moral at the work, well, then it could be a period problems with your qualification, and that's all. So, this is the serious thing.
And uh, the good thing is that there are several special professional agencies. They are good if you are looking for a high position. For example, in one of the companies where I was working as a business consultant, we needed a very high-level vice president. And we asked the agency, and they find it out, the person, in three days. This was really, really brilliant candidate for this position. If we will go in the way to announce, well, then we will have the hundreds of persons, and from which 95% without any real qualification and skills, or not the same as written in their CVs, and then you will have the problems. So, if you want to find out such high-level professionals, this could be done easily through these professional agencies, which are working quite good. Usually, it will not cost any, just to say, fund for you. It will cost for the candidate, because they are working in that way. They are taking uh, funds from the guy to whom they find out this job. This is also a small but bonus for your business activities. Do you have any questions? Please. Yes. How high the rate of unemployment? Oh my God! Excellent question. Officially, sixteen point five percent. Officially. Officially. And honestly speaking, I do not have any reasons to say that our statistics department could not really calculate unemployment rate. They are very professional guys. They are using the best I.O. methodologies, I.O. you know, yeah? International Labor Organization. So, this is 16.5%. But, then you will look to the figures how this labor force is distributed. And you will find it out 55% in agriculture. This is a total disaster because the higher figure has only a silver. What it means? It means that due to ILO standards, any person who has the land would be calculated not as unemployed person, but as self-employed in agriculture. And due to this, you have this then, how many persons from this amount want to find out real play, paid job? This is a huge question mark, and I could only calculate on the basis of comparative analysis. When agriculture is effective. The most effective agriculture is in Denmark, and they have 2.7% of all workforce in the agricultural sector. Even higher in effectiveness are the United States. They have below 1%. But this means that the persons who are working on the land it doesn't mean the veterinaries and other guys who are in the service sector. Okay, just look at the countries which has the same, just to say, historical tradition on the ground like Georgia, and we could look at Bulgaria, we could look at Romania, we could look at Macedonia, Croatia, and we will find out that the, from the total workforce, they have 15 to 20% in agriculture, and this is very hard. Normally, in agriculture, should be 5 to 7, and it's still not with the effective agriculture. And then if we will say that 
of the total workforce should be as maximum in agriculture. In Georgia, you have a difference 35%, which is the number which, by methodology, they are not unemployed. But they are eager and keen to have paid jobs. Did I explain in a right way? Did you catch the figures? So, this is the reality. And once more, uh, statistical department is not, is not uh, falsifying the figures. No, they are using the right methodology. They are calculating in the absolutely right way. But all these persons with the small lens, uh, which are considered as self-employed persons, they are in reality, they are unemployed. And if the total workforce of Georgia is calculated as 1,090,000, then we could easily calculate from this which is the total workforce, and then you calculate from this what could be the situation. And then we are coming back to the situation how these persons could be protected by law. And it seems that it would be very, very, just to say, optimistic to say <coughs> that even changes in law will give them the excellent opportunities to protect uh, their position. Another quite interesting thing which uh, we have in Georgia, which is not, uh, honestly speaking, it's not calculated, but we find out through different surveys. So there is a thing that employed persons, approximately from 25 to 27 percent, they are employed on more than one position. This is also quite interesting. And honestly speaking, for the moment, I don't have the explanation for this figure. I hope that on our next meeting in the next year, I could explain it to you. Okay, do you have any questions? Yes. Uh, what is the labor cost in Georgia? Like minimum wage, average wage? You are asking how the statistical department is uh, calculating. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, do you have any minimum wage uh, situation? Can you put 10 euros? Okay. <laughs> Divide it on two, then deduct it 10%. <laughs> this is the minimum. And there is a huge discussion that we should increase. But till I could uh, say to you, this, the solution is not that you will put something in the document. Then the business will change the contract, and they will put not five days per week, but four days per week in your contract, and will pay you accordingly. But you will work in reality five days. It's a problem. So, uh, if you are looking at the average costs, I could advise you to visit the website of the Georgian Statistical Department, which is uh, www.jostat.ca. And then, there is an English version also there, for sure. And then you will find out in industry, in trade sector, they are calculating this average salaries. But uh, problem is not the average salary. Problem is unit labor cost. If you want to be competitive, you should have high figures in the unit labor cost. It doesn't matter how much you are paid. The matter of things is how much you are producing in one hour when you are paid this amount of money. Did I answer? Yes. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, just have 15 minutes break.